Here I am, making my way through the harried halls of readings, splitting people apart so I can make it to the microphone so that I can say to you, welcome on behalf of readings, on behalf of Pan Macmillan. It is such a treat to have everybody here in this crowded, glorious space of ideas. You know what is terrific about tonight? Tonight, we have got women talking. And not only that, we've got two women authors. And not only that, my friends, we have got women booksellers. Do you know that Rosalie Hamm and Gabrielle Williams have been or still are booksellers at readings? <gasps> Drum roll. And the applause is enormous to have three wonderful women booksellers all speaking at the one time is a glorious, glorious thing. But before we get going, we need to acknowledge something and we need to acknowledge that all of us, with all of our ideas, with all of our love, with all of our gratitude, we are grateful to be living in this beautiful country, this country that is not ours. We're all living on stolen ground. It's land that's not been ceded. At the moment, I am speaking from the Kulin Nation and I would like to pay my respects on behalf of you all, wherever you are in Australia, to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for showing me ways to make sense of this country, for showing me the stories and the song lines. I want to say thank you for sharing. Now, let me introduce one of my dearest friends, the very wonderful Gab Williams. This woman is not only someone with the gift of the Gab, but she is a published author. She's a bookseller. She is... Uh, a very witty, wonderful woman. And I want you all, wherever you are in your home, to raise a glass to the one and only Gab Williams as she talks to the glorious Rosalie Ham. Thanks, Chris. Um, firstly, that was such a beautiful um, acknowledgement of country, Chris. I really... Uh, appreciated all of that. Um, probably one of the best I've ever seen done. Well done. Um, and how exciting to have Rosalie Ham here. Woo! And I know that everyone's on mute, so we can't actually hear or see any of the clapping, but I know that there is a bunch of clapping going on right now. Um, today, I'll be chatting to Rosalie for about half an hour, and then it's over to you, the audience, for any questions you might have. So simply type them in and I'll read them out to Rosalie for you. So that's the housekeeping all done and out of the way. And now on to the main event. Rosalie Ham, who of course needs no introduction, writer of The Dressmaker, There Should Be More Dancing, The Year of the Farmer, Summer at Mount Hope, and now The Dressmaker's Secret. Also dancing partner of Hugo Weaving, Hanger Outera with Kate Winslet and Stand Upper for Little People Everywhere. I absolutely loved your new book, Rosalie. It's funny and savage and infuriating and satisfying. Um, spending time with Tilly Dunnage and the divine Sergeant Farrett was like sitting down with favourite old friends and listening to them talk about their very interesting lives. It also made me want to get out my sewing machine. I'm actually not joking. I really wanted to start doing some sewing. Um, fortunately, I put that aside because I suspected I might be a bit like um, Gertrude. Was it Gertrude who decided to take it up again? Yes. <laughs> I think I might be a little bit like Gertrude. Um, there were parts of it that laugh out loud funny and other parts that had my anxiety levels rising at the unfairness of it all. So well done. And thank you for giving me such an enjoyable experience. So are you going to start off with a reading? I am. And I've, I've chosen a piece that actually doesn't have Tilly in it. It's got Sergeant Farrett. Oh, I love Sergeant Farrett. Yep, and it's just the, the introduction. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody out there who's watching. I can't see you. Um, you can see me and you can't see any of the mess around me happily. You can just see. <laughs> so this is good. 
So I'm just going to read a little part that introduces you to hold it up, um, <laughs> Sergeant, Sergeant Farage. And this is on page 14, so it's very early in the book. Um, at the rear of an old milliner's shop in Darling Street, East Melbourne, client number 114 glanced up and down the lane and slipped quietly through the gate. She unlocked the back door, lowered all the blinds, and as she moved through the kitchen and workroom to the old shop front, turned the lights on. Again, she checked that the curtain was pulled tight before removing her hat and placing it carefully on an old milliner's block. She removed her coat, brushed the damp from it, and hung it in the cupboard under the stairs. Then she went up to her bedroom where she unzipped her skirt, unbuttoned her blouse and kicked her shoes into the corner. Hoisting up her petticoat and rolling her step-ins down, she peeled off her stockings and kicked the warm soft mass into the corner with her shoes. Then she luxuriated in scratching her hairy stomach. Later, comfortable in her cushioned armchair, wearing hair and pants and Alibaba slippers, she knitted her thick hands working away in the light of the standard lamp. She sipped her gin and tonic and sighed, whistling a little. Suddenly she dropped her knitting and bolted down the stairs to the front door, her slippers scraping across the old English tiles. A plain envelope waited in the wire litter box attached to the back of the door. She gently picked it up and turned it over in her big soft hands. On the back, printed in elegant type were two words, Salon Mystique. Breathless, she went to the writing desk, took a pearl-handled pocket knife and sliced the open the envelope. Then she carefully extracted the letter and with one hand on her beating heart read, an appointment has been allocated for your first fitting. Please telephone to confirm. Thank you, Madame Flock. Telephone 861231. Oh, my pretty hat, she said, fanning herself with the envelope. And that's where I'll stop. And it just keeps going on from there with those charming, gorgeous characters. Um, so, I mean, you have got fantastic characters all through your book. They're flawed and they're funny and and they're, they're very real. Um, but but the, the dresses and the dressmaking is also another character in the book. I'm sure that I'm not the first person who's noticed this. <laughs> so... Are you a dressmaker? I know your mum was a dressmaker. Are you a dressmaker? And no. and if you are, no, you're not. Okay. Well, there goes my next question. Have you sewn yourself a COVID mask? <laughs> no, but I but I like when I need to, I can hem a dress or I can put a zip in or and I can, you know, do certain things. But you know, it seems dresses and dressmakers have got a knack. Mm. Um, it's like I said to someone this morning, it's like when they pick up a pencil or when you pick up a pencil and discover you can draw, it's the same for seamstresses. And I, if you have, if you can't do that, then don't. I, <laughs> well, I think there's plenty of the, in this book who can't and do, which is clearly um, a part of the, part of the charm of the book as well is these people who are trying for not necessarily all the right reasons, not because they love it, but because they want fame or fortune or whatever. Um, there was one dress in particular that I loved, and I'm not going to talk too much about the dresses because they're, you know, I mean, obviously there's other, so many other things to talk about, but Nita Orland's dress when she goes to the Smalls Ball was so spectacular and it was described so beautifully and basically I want to wear that dress have you do you sketch them how do you come up with these designs is it no just plagiarism just absolutely <laughs> came from a book a book on Erta e-i-e-r-e-e-r-e-t-e -E -E -E. uh, and he was a designer and he was from um it was oh art deco kind of fashion and he designed the most glorious outfits which were never made because they would have been too expensive and highly Im impractical but he's he's my go-to for people like Nita so mm -hmm. I just took one of his designs and altered it so that it fitted Nita and got her up those stairs and into that venue for the coronation ball the first one of the season because it needed to be a fantastic dress that just basically kind of went like that to all of the people and um until he had made it for her and and so i 
I just, I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed dressing everybody this time. Yeah, I'll bet you did. Well, I loved reading about it. It made me want to sort of like go and get out my, you know, especially it was kind of cruel reading it because we have been in lockdown here in Melbourne and haven't been able to do any shopping at all. So it was kind of mean reading it. But anyway, I'll, I'll forgive you. Hey, I've got a quick, quick pop quiz. Uh, silk or cashmere? Silk. Zip or buttons? Buttons. <laughs> French seams or overlocker? French seams. Yeah, I thought you'd say French seams. <laughs> All right. So everyone wanted to know what happened after the dressmaker and you didn't go there. So how long has Tilly Dunnage been trailing you, tapping you on the shoulder, trying to get your attention, wanting you to sit down with you, with her? So can you talk us through that process? Yes, uh, uh, with 20 years, actually, uh, 20 years almost to the month that wow. it came out. Uh, it was launched at Readings, The Dressmaker by Anthony Yark, uh, my teacher from RMIT. And um, what happened then was it went onto the VCE literature list and then, of course, it was turned into a film and the costumes went on tour and I found myself talking about it for 20 years. Mm. And in talking about it, um, and answering questions to school students, the characters were getting more and more fleshed out in my mind and there were backgrounds being built and psychological insight that wasn't necessarily in the first attempt, the, the dressmaker, but people wanted to talk about it, especially school students. They ask the best questions when they've got to write an essay on it. And while all that was going on, I was attending... Um, fashion events and taking a huge amount of interest in the craft of dressmaking and couture because you've got to if you're writing a sequel it has to have a, a, a similar if you can emotional impact to the first so I needed to have a, a progression and a development and something big bigger for Tilly Dunnage to say and it all had to do with costume so I had to take that simple idea of costume as a weapon or a lie and expand on that and I I just arrived at it naturally mm -hmm. um, and realized that I thought I had a really good idea and I and, I, and so I took all the notes I'd been taking and all the information I've been reading about over the 20 years and just sat one day, sat down one day and, and wrote it, and there and it came out. It just just was bubbling away. So I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. So it must be a very. I mean, I sort of feel like it must be quite a hard process to write something when you're referring to things from what 20 years ago, and you didn't you didn't kind of like um, you know lay it all out for the reader. You know, you kind of like had expectations that the reader would have some memories but also you I think you kind of went well I'm going to take I'm expecting you to come with me on this and I'm not going to spoon feed you and I really like that I really like that thing of going oh my god I can't quite remember what happened with this and you know so that was sort of really nice but but so what were the challenges writing a book a sequel so much after the first one <laughs> Precisely that, getting the balance right so that you could just, because I was aware that some people might come along and pick it up and just start reading, not realising that it was a, a sequel. So, And I wanted them to, to want to read the first book. So I, I kind of put important things in, especially to do with Beulah and Marigold and, of course, Tilly and Teddy and all the main characters and Elspeth and William and Gertrude back in Dungata. So I put in things about them that spoke of their trajectory and their satisfying denouement <laughs> um, satisfying. Um, and then it was but at the same time keeping the story moving forward and those flashbacks also had to serve not just as a flashback but it's meant to move the story forward so they had to inform and progress as well as remind so that that was a bit tricky and it took a couple of people to say to me you don't need this bit and you've repeated that already and but that's what editors are for and that that's why they're lovely and and I found writing for people that knew stuff just my style and how I was going to express myself and how to put the words on the page the voice or one of the voices anyway of the whole novel um like the narrative how that was going to keep them 
engaged and absorbed, um, even though they kind of knew. Because they don't, people don't mind re revisiting scenes and actions, I don't think, I assumed anyway, but they, but with that, they want something good and wonderful and nice and interesting to hold their attention as they're just reading the words on the page. So all of those things came into play. Um, but do you know, I had such a lovely time vis revisiting all those horrible people. Um, and it was such fun. It's enormous fun um, that it, it was just a delightful thing to do, really. Sometimes the um, ugliest characters are the most fun to write, aren't they? Oh, yeah. And also the, the trick is to make them likeable. And my model initially with the dressmaker was the Macbeth thing because in Macbeth, people quite liked Lady Macbeth and, and Macbeth, though they hated them. Mm -hmm. And in the end, there were hundreds of people strewn on the stage dead. And so that was a bit of a trick to kind of do that a, again, be mean and nasty and horrible but make people understand why yeah we were being that way and um um and also just the, the sheer joy of making writing awful people it's yeah yeah fun. yeah and then balancing it with really beautiful people as well yeah, yes sometimes yeah. they can sometimes they can be almost and i really love that um Tilly and Sergeant Farrett and the do you say McSwineys or McSweeneys? I say the McSwineys, but yeah. You should know. <laughs> um I, I just felt that um you know sometimes those really lovely characters can be a bit trickier to get right because they can sometimes be a little bit um you know nice is nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just kept in the back of my mind that these people are the truth and they are good. Mm. They didn't have to be perfect. They didn't have to be nice. But uh, it was the same with Molly. Molly was true and she was good and, and she used kind of language as her weapon and her defence. So I, I just kept telling myself that they are the truth and they are the only good people mm. um, and approached it from that. Yeah. Well, you raised some really um, sort of shocking things in the book and... Two of them that I found really, one was that um, homosexuality was a crime punishable by death. Yes. I mean, up, what the hell? <laughs> up until 1949. I mean, I don't know how often that, that happened, but if you were accused of that and if someone really wanted to, you know, hurt you, that, that was still the law. I mean, no wonder it was so terrifying. I mean, no wonder... Um, you know, for Sergeant Barrett, there was that sense of not being able to, you know, that that um, people could manipulate and um, and you know be you know like put pressure on just because of that was mm. and also the way you know the child services, the child protection services were so. Is it what do you think it was? I mean, I, I know that it was. It was like that with you know our Aboriginal kids and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, that was also really. I found that. So, did you do a lot of read? Was that one of the things that you wanted to expressly look into? Or look, I grew up with that. I grew up in a small um, country town, and it, we tolerated our own. Um, idiosyncratic people and so that's why it was all right for Sergeant Ferret to be in Dungatar because everybody had a secret nobody said anything about anybody else's you know mm. so it worked quite well he could indulge his passion knowing full well that they wouldn't dare say anything <laughs> um unless they wanted to hurt him so when he came to Melbourne um he, he found his he found his gang but they were still you know they were they were still in dire danger the whole time and when I was a kid growing up in Gerildery there was still a thing you could get sent to the reformatory and mm. I know there was kids around me that did get sent to the reformatory and there wasn't they weren't doing anything terrible they had parents that were probably working very hard and they didn't the parents didn't suit someone from perhaps some religious organization or their their, their father had done something wrong and they were just taken away and sent to the reformatory for a while yeah. and it was a thing in the in the lexicon it was kind of like 
oh, she's gone to the reformatory. She'll probably be back in six months or, you know. So I, I would, and that was a bit of a threat too. I heard it used, um, bandied around by parents. You misbehave, I'll tell the welfare. That sort of thing. I might start using it with my children. Does it still work these days? No, they would say, I've got human rights and they'd use <laughs> <laughs> hey um Rosalie, so you your book is very funny as well so you've got these these things that are kind of like i mean tilly is um under real pressure because of um the way that society is but you do manage to be very funny as well so um, how many drafts does it take? So this might seem a weird question. Maybe you write from the start, write funny. But um, I find that it takes me a few drafts before my humour starts coming out on the page. Is that is that what it's like for you? Or do you just like do it straight away? No, I kind of do it straight away. But then I go back. You probably do too. You probably just don't realise it. But you plant the seeds for it. And then as you're doing drafts, or I do, um, and you would too, you just make it better. Mm. Like, so you can say what you've got to say. Yeah. And then you go, okay, fine. And then you just go back and start again and do it better and do it better again and do it better again. And did so, you know what your ending was going to be? Yeah, I did. <laughs> um uh, but I had different people. I had a different person executing that ending, uh, and then I had an epiphany um, about three drafts in, and I kind of changed the whole thing around. And I thought that people are either going to go with this, or they're just going to close the book and throw it away and go, oh, no, no. no. I don't think anyone's going to throw it away and go, oh, because it's actually it's very funny. The ending I found was very <laughs> black, black as we as we probably would expect from you, black but also yeah, quite funny. So, so how many drafts did you do? I reckon all up, I probably did about six, and three of them would have been um, under the tutelage or guidance of the fantastic editors at Pan Macmillan. Mm. Or maybe six or, or or seven, but you see, and you would know this. There's there's a draft that I wrote years ago that I really must bin, that had threads of the one that, that exists now, but for this particular one, I'd say probably six or seven. Yeah, and a, a lot of them were just kind of well, you just do a wash through or whatever the technical term is for it. Yeah, yeah. It's a very fun part of the process, I find, when you actually have got other people who are as invested in your writing as you are. Oh, isn't it good? Yeah, yeah, it's a really and nice feeling. you confirmed and you feel like, okay, and you kind of got a licence to be even better. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like it. I like it. I like it and to be able to sit down with someone because it's not really, I mean, you know, like you probably don't have a lot of people who if they go, how's your day been writing? You go, yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> or bad. That's yeah. about it. Yeah. 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 So it's nice to have people that like you like you say have an interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so do you want to tell us about being published the first time? Oh, jeepers, I will never forget. Like that is the that was the, the turning point. Again, going back to RMIT, um, and we were warned that perhaps our first novel may not get published that perhaps it would be the second one where we found out if we had anything to add to the great bank of humanity or whether we were just writing my terrible childhood and getting it off our chest and moving on seamlessly and free of burden forever. Is that, is that how it was described? More, more or less, my memory. <laughs> yeah, more or less. But I thought, oh, well, I probably won't get published. And so I um, kind of went to town on it and just, had a really good time and then at the end of three years um <clears throat> or four years there was a hardcore group of us that had stuck to the whole uh thing and we just decided amongst ourselves to send it off to a publisher just for the heck of it to see what would see what would happen and we all expected not to hear anything back for months or get a letter that said have you finished are there any more chapters or get a rejection 
Mm. Better. And so we were, were kind of reading out the rejection letters and there were five star one or a three star one or a one star one or whatever. And we, I got rejected by everybody. And then um, one person, one of the people that rejected me said, we can't publish this because we've got our quota for the year and we've, you know, well, they had some reason. And they said, why don't you try Duffy and Snellgrove? I phoned Duffy and Snellgrove and within three weeks, they got back to me. And I uh, remember it because I was eating muesli. <laughs> and I had to quickly get rid of the muesli. And they said, we'd like to work with you with a view to publication, which I'd learnt from Anthony Yark at RMIT, was a, a way of saying, <clears throat> pardon me, if you don't do exactly what we say, because we're the publishers and we know what to do and we know how to make a product, we're not going to work with you. You're going to be difficult. And so I just went, sure, I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> I was trying to go, oh, God, everybody's going to read this. My mother's going to read this. Um, but I just was certain that it would get on that shelf in readings with the thousand other books and sink without a trace. Oh, my God, and how amazing that it did so fantastically well. It's, it's very good. serendipitous, isn't it? I mean, it depends on the person who reads it, whether it's going to have, Yes. Whether it gets off that first off that first bench or not, doesn't it? Absolutely. Well, it's luck and timing, and we've got J.K. Rowling to thank for that because that and uh, Stephen King. I think I think they were both dragged off the slush pile, you know. And then you think about how many other brilliant tomes are out there, and they just didn't click in the first couple of pages with the uh, with the wrong person. So. Yeah. I remember. I remember when um, with my first book, and I, someone t uh, told me that in it, Penguin. I don't know if this is true, but someone who worked at Penguin said it. They could have been exaggerating, but they said that there are three thousand manuscripts in the slush pile room, and that they get the work. Ex uh, maybe it wasn't Penguin actually. I've just realised I might be talking out of turn, and I don't think it was Penguin. It was another publisher, but um, that there were you know, thousands of books and sometimes they would just say to the work experience person, just go in and have a read and see if there's anything good. So it's kind of sort of amazing to think that anyone really gets published when you think about those odds of one little manuscript in so many. Um, yeah. It's probably a lie. Someone told me it's probably a lie. <laughs> I've seen a slush pile. They're pretty big. They are, you know, quite, quite big. I don't know, don't know who reads them, but. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, okay, now we have got a few questions for you and I know that um, I was sort of, do you want to ask? Oh, so let me just have a quick little look at what some of the questions are. And while I'm looking at what some of the questions are, maybe you can tell us what your writing regime is. Oh, um, it's the same as everybody else's. <laughs> you make a cup of tea. Um, and if you want to get anything done, you go immediately to your office. You don't stop at the sink. You don't make toast. You don't speak to anybody. You just go up there and you write till you don't feel guilty anymore. Mm. And then you come down and you can have a cup of coffee. And if you've been really good, you're allowed to go to the letterbox. Um, it's it's like that. But but I, I'm, I like it, and you probably do too, when you get to a certain point. That's just a joy and a pleasure. That's just, you're compelled by that. And that's when you turn into the kind of person that scowls at people and puts their phone on silent and throws themselves to the floor when someone walks past in case they see you <laughs> um, outside because you just want to keep doing what you're doing while you've got that thing. Yeah. You know? so, it's an amazing, isn't it amazing when you sort of like look up and you go, oh, my gosh, I better go and do something. Go, oh, my God, I cannot believe I've been working for this long and it feels like, yeah. 20 minutes yeah no it's a very good thing mm -hmm. um so there are a couple of questions here one is um i feel that i need to reread the dressmaker um for the third time <laughs> before reading the sequel which i purchased today do you think that's written necessary rosalie i don't think so not after three goes <laughs> i think you'll be you'll be right but the, but the thing is you have you decide you start reading it and if you have a yen to rush back and reread the dressmaker and because you've read it three times already it won't take long mm. so i'll leave it entirely up to you but i have accommodated you there are things there that will jog your memory 
Mm. Well, I have to say that having read it, and I haven't read The Dressmaker for a while, and I didn't go back and look at the movie. I was tempted to go back and look at the movie, but then I thought, no, I'll just, I'll, I won't because I didn't want to have those that sort of image in my head. But um, not that I loved the movie as well. The movie was gorgeous. But um, Sandra, I think that um, you will probably want to pick it up afterwards and reread. That's what I'm wanting to. I'm now going to go back to the dressmaker and have a read of it because I just go, oh, I just want to. So, but, it, but you don't need to, not at all. Um, there is someone here, um, I'm, I guess I can say names, Robin Black has just said she still remembers you presenting and workshopping it at the 2001 Shepherd and Country Festival of Writing. I remember that festival and then it didn't ever come back again, that festival. I don't oh. know. It was, yeah, and I quite liked that. And that. I think that was one of my first festivals and I remember I was very nervous and I packed far too many outfits and when I got there everybody else was just dressed in normal daggy clothes and I was embarrassed to take my suitcases from the motel back to my car because there was so many of them I remember that but but I'm better at it I'm much better at it now. Do you feel pressure in what you wear because you've written this the dressmaker I mean is that a pressure people kind of go just going to clock what you're wearing? No, I don't. I don't. I'm happy to say that I'm not a seamstress, and I, and I like to read about it. But I, I don't care what I look like as long as I feel comfortable in whatever I'm, yeah, on the stage or you know wearing. I, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Here is a question from Sarah. How would you describe the people of Dungata? Would you agree that they are united in some way, perhaps more than they think? Oh yes. No, they're united in um, a common hatred of the enemy and they're bonded and united over the the lie that was the, initially the one that was told by Evan Pettyman about the circumstances of Tilly's death and subsequent death of Stuart Pettyman so no they're very loyal people they stick together um and they they still are because we in the dressmaker's secret we we're forced to go back to Dungatar and Tilly's forced to go back to Dungatara and they're all still out there living at Fart Hill um, <laughs> and they are united. Mm. I was, yes, uh, there were a few things about that that I found quite interesting and I don't want to sort of say too much because I don't want to wreck it for everyone but I was quite interested the way you had Dungatara set up. <laughs> um, yes, it's a gradual process but the key to that is that while Tilly Dunnage is building a future a new future, Dungatar is building exactly the same mm. and they have not progressed, whereas Tilly has. Mm. Um, but I won't say anything more. No, that. we'll keep. <laughs> um, there is a question. Uh, oh, so Robin Black also says that you were fantastic at the um, Shepherd and Festival. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Um, Annika says, Rosalie, love your work. Just wondering in relation to Tilly as a character, how would you describe her in the first novel and how would you describe her transformation to the second novel? In the first novel, Tilly was a pretty two-dimensional character, I have to say. It was her presence that was the catalyst for things to occur. Uh, it's a little bit the same in the second one, but she has more to say. Mm. She's got more of an interior point of view more of an emotional development and she's stronger and she's more determined um and her journey is it just started when she looked down upon the people of Dungatara and went after molly died and went right you bastards mm -hmm. um and she's kind of building on that but she has in leaving Dungatara, she had created another past to flee um so she she realizes that she can't do that and I, I won't say any more, except that I, she ends up in a far better place. Yeah, yeah. I, and I really, one of the things that I really loved about it was that you've got it set in Melbourne, in the city, but it's still got a real feel of, um, it, it still has a country feel to it. And I know that you, you, I have read that you said that you wouldn't, you originally said that you wouldn't set a book in the city because you felt like, um, I've got it written down, um, you felt that your your style of writing would be changed due to the landscape and you didn't want to do that, but it, it wasn't changed. That was a lie. 
that was all right. I don't know what it was with that, but that, but no, my my style is my style now, and I, and I, and I've actually suddenly, as you were saying that, I realised, but they are country people in the city, so mm. it's okay to write in a more rural, countrified style because um, it just makes sense. Well, but there is still that sense of a village anyway. Yeah, you know, it feels like maybe because it's set in the fifties or something, but it still feels very sort of, you know, just very grounded and. But there know. are communities like that. Yeah. I, people say, "Oh, are all small country towns like that?" And I and I just say, every staff room is like that. Your urban <laughs> street is like that. Your family at Christmas is like that. You know all their secrets. You know what to lie. You know all their weaknesses and all that kind of stuff so it's not just country towns and it's it's universal it's everywhere it must have been so funny when the dressmaker came out and then you had to like go to all the people in your country town and say oh no no these these aren't you and, and I had to do it over and over again and the thing I loved is that someone come out of the crowd clutching the book and say I know these people. Oh. <laughs> They're all here. And the other thing I really love is that people will come out and say, our cross dresser was named so and so. Or, oh. you know, and they, they talked about, or they came out of the, the crowd and said, I was bullied and, you know, this, all those sorts of things. So, wow. It's, uh, it's such, I think writing a book or making a story or doing anything like that that pleases people, it's, infinitely more rewarding for the person that's done it than the people because you just feel smug. <laughs> you, don't feel smug but you just feel as if you're doing something worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, especially when people, you write something where people can really relate and see themselves on the page, which is, you know, and now I think we're doing so much better with that, but a long time ago, well, I mean, 20 years ago, no, we weren't. Hmm. I mean, I think I sort of feel like I can still remember reading about Sergeant Farrett at first and going, oh, that's, I mean, not, but, you know, just going, oh, I, I wouldn't have, I didn't expect that of him because he was the cop and all that sort of stuff and really liked that he took that sort of the cop and he was the one. There wasn't anyone else. It was really sort of nice. Well, everybody's uh, got a secret. Yeah. Um, so we've only got five minutes to go. Um I've got one more question. Well, I've got a few more, but I don't, I'm not, I'm going to choose one. Um, this is from Sarah. She goes, I really enjoy the realism in your novels, the relationships, the personalities, behaviours and biases, the graphic, some of the violent scenes are the most, oh, impactful. Um, and I think that this, Sarah must have read this draft, I think. But, so I won't say what she says, but it is to do with, um, Marigold and the welfare officer close to the end. Ah. Um, what is it about realism that appeals to you? Have you ever been tempted to temper the realistic themes in any of your narratives? No, um, I haven't because within the culture and the context of that book, that was a justified thing. That was a just ending. And it, and that's that was the deal with... Um, Tilly as well, and it's it carries on through the dressmaker's secret that if you build that culture and you dwell within that culture, then you do what's appropriate in that culture. And really, um, I think it's a lovely thing when there's a dastardly character and that character gets their comeuppance. You know, you just you're sitting in bed with your book. You tend to go yes. Very, very satisfying. Um, Sarah's just written and she said, I am talking about the original dressmaker. So I have just done a spoiler for Sarah about the dressmaker secret. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I think we're going to have to finish up. Rosalie, thank you so much. It was so fantastic. This is the dressmaker secret. I expect this book is going to be everywhere, trams, cafes, under Christmas trees, um, but only because it totally should be. I, I almost struggle to think of someone who won't love it. Thank you for such an enjoyable evening, Rosalie. It was so lovely chatting to you and Thank good you. luck with it all. Thank you. Thank you for everybody for attending and 
I wish you all the best. Have I'll have a stay safe and well and have a brilliant Christmas. Rosalie, <laughs> thank you so much. And to you, Gav, thank you so much, Rosalie. I want you to know that the doors to readings are always open for you. If you need to come back into a, be- a book selling kind of capacity, I just know that we would always find a place for you. <laughs> I absolutely do know that. Yeah, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> To you both, thank you so much for an enjoyable evening. How wonderful just to have women just talking about women's stories and a little anger as well. Thank goodness. It's exactly how we want our females. Rosalie, Gab, to all of you that came, stay well. Uh, And my final word, of course, is please, please keep reading. Good night, everyone. (laughs) Bye. Bye.